After my last video, I was reading through the comments on uh, a website about uh, my video, and there was a comment that really struck me. And it actually led to me going through quite a bit of a personal journey in the last few days. And um, the comment was simply that cults don't necessarily appear in a religious or pseudo-religious context they can also occur within a family. And I hadn't actually considered that a family could be a cult. But um, I actually come from a, a very dysfunctional family. A very dysfunctional family. And this comment struck a chord with me. And I was lying awake one night and there was a memory that just kept coming back over and over again. My subconscious is bringing this memory out, um, which I hadn't really thought about for, for a long time. But it seems to be very relevant. I thought I might share the memory and maybe another memory of mine and, um, and explore this idea of can families be cults? Can you actually live in a, a cult and not realize that your family is a cult? So in this memory, it was um, a few years ago, quite a few years ago, um, I was at a pub with my family, um, specifically my three older sisters and my mother. Um, and at the time, my, one of my sisters was breaking up with her, her partner and, um, uh, who is uh, the father of one of her children and a, a breakup that it didn't have to be messy, but my sister was determined to make it as messy as possible for her and her children and him and the family. Um, and one of the issues that centered around was the house, who was going to get the house. Now, he had offered her a 40% um, stake share value of the, the house that they lived in. And um, she was not happy with this. My sister felt that she was entitled to the entire house. And um, her argument was that, um, and I could understand her argument, is that she'd been the breadwinner for the last seven years and he'd been unemployed for seven years. And therefore, uh, the house should go to her. However, um, the house was actually bought with money that his father had donated to him. And I was just thinking about this, and also as if the court's going to completely demolish the father if he's going to get joint custody. Um, they, they can't really do that. So I told my sister, I said, you know, whoa, 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 watch out. This is, this is a pretty big step that you're trying to take. I would just take his offer now. Take that 40%. Don't go to court. Don't make things worse than they have to be. Um, that 40% is a, is a reasonable offer. Um, and the, I actually went into detail because um, I, I said to her that if you take this to court, what's going to happen is the court's going to pretty much decide that his deal was good in the, be in the end. It's going to take you years. It's going to be really painful, stressful, traumatic going through the court procedure. And ultimately, you're only going to get 20%, he's going to get 40%, and your lawyer is going to get 20%, and his lawyer is going to get 20%. And you've gone nowhere but just put your whole life on hold for two years. Um, and like, I gave her this advice because I, I really do care about my family. I, I do care about family, and I, I wanted to protect my sister. I wanted to protect her from a decision which I did not think was a very wise decision. And so I'm not telling her this to, to put her down or, or to discount her experience or her, or her belief that she is entitled to this because I, I could see that there, there was, in a, in a sense, I could, from that perspective, that there was some injustice done to her. But um, I, I just didn't see the sense in taking him to court. Now, my sister did not like my advice. She got very, very angry with me and she actually picked up a glass of water and threw it at my face. Um, and she screamed um, that she had no brother, her brothers were dead to her, and she took her children and stormed out of the pub. So this is all in public, everyone got to see this happen. And um, yeah, so she behaved absolutely reprehensibly. And um, that, you know, I could have handled that alone because that I could have just gone, yeah, okay, that was my sister. She's always been a bit emotionally unstable and unpredictable and, um, and violent, um, I have to also say. And so um, I could 
kind of deal with it because yeah while well, she was in a really stressful situation things were really bad for her and, and her family at that time um but at the but the thing that that really traumatized me that that made this memory a traumatic what i'd call a traumatic memory was how my other two sisters and my mother reacted after my sister left and so their reaction was basically to say that it was entirely me at fault that I was at fault. I had I should have been completely supportive of my sister regardless of what she was saying and regardless of how thoughtless and impulsive her decision um, which ultimately she did decide to go ahead and take it to court and challenge him to try and get full ownership of the house. Um, but um yeah, no, having and, and they, this is the thing that like you get these things in your memory burned in watching my sisters and my mother smile as they're, 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 they're going, look, you got to take, worry about her feelings. She's really hurt. You just got to support her 100% because she's in a really hurt place and you just got to be respectful of that. And, and I'm just sitting there going, she just threw a glass at my face. She just screamed at me. She accused me of, 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 of basically hating her or being against her. I mean, not in those words, but like she made really nasty accusations against me. And I genuinely came from a place of caring and I was trying to protect her. I was trying to protect my family um, from making a, a terrible mistake. And um, and I'm, I'm getting lectured as if I'm in the wrong. And not only that, I'm being told that I'm not allowed to feel hurt. I'm not allowed to be a victim of my my sister's um, very bad behavior, and um, and that really stuck with me. And uh, definitely, you know, I mean, I was already quite estranged emotionally from my family well before that event, but still, that was just another nail in the coffin. Um, but yeah, like concerning how hurt and embarrassed I was after that happened. Um, Anyway, so uh, my sister, she ends up pushing this court case uh, against her, uh, her former partner, and um, and she okay, it was really nasty. This is a really nasty two years fighting him, trying to get revenge for how she perceived him to have mistreated her. Uh, she even went to the police to to file false accusations. Um, and she lied a, a lot and just rewrote history and things that just didn't happen. And um, nobody pushed back on this. They just, they kind of like, oh, they kind of complained about how she was behaving, but they didn't really give her support and they didn't really push back on her craziness either. And they kind of just basically enabled her to be self-destructive. And in the end, um, the, the court decision was that his original offer was the fair one. Um, they supported the, the 40 60 Thing. And uh, after two years of, of heartache and, and mess and, and alienation of, and traumatized children, um, that she got 20% of the house's value, he got 40%, and their lawyers got 20% each. It was like, it was almost, when I heard this, it was almost like, um, wow, am I psychic? I, I saw this happening two years ago. Um, mind you, I think if you're if you know anything about the family court you can under and how the legal system works, you could have seen this coming back then as well. It's not that difficult if you apply a bit of thinking to it. And um, and I go to my mother, like, that's exactly what I warned her would happen. I, two years ago, I warned her this is what would happen. And my mother's response was like, Jason, you must never tell your sister that. You must never remind her of that because it would hurt her too much. And it's like, oh fuck, just fuck now. It's like it just that doesn't occur. It doesn't occur to anyone in my family that maybe I, maybe I might be hurt. Maybe I might be hurt by this injustice. That 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 I have been uh, wronged. I've been violently attacked, and I've been accused of these horrendous things. And and then I, I get no vindication, no acknowledgement, no apology for this. The I, my my feelings don't exist. And and. And I think the reason why it was this memory that was coming up when the reference to the cult comment was like, 
this is the cult of my family, that men don't have feelings, and we don't have feelings that matter. Only women have feelings, and only their feelings matter. And, um, and it's... <sighs> And like, and words like, oh, it would upset her too much. Like, they kind of ring in my ears. It's like I've just heard this so many times throughout my life about how, like, I'm, I've, at times I've wanted to, I've urged my family, hey, we've got a lot of problems in the family. We should have counseling. We should have therapy. We should do group therapy. We should talk it out. And I've just been told, oh, no, we can't do that because it would upset too many people to talk about it. And again, it's like, well, who? Which people would be upset? It's, it's clearly like it's it's upsetting to me that we're not talking about it. It's upsetting to me that we aren't getting therapy. We aren't uh, investigating and looking at this dysfunction in the family. Um, but that doesn't matter because it would upset women in the family. Women would be upset if we talked about it. Um, and again, it was like, like again, it's like a, it's not a case of like my my feelings as male. Um, don't matter. It's more that my feelings as a male just don't exist. It's like, don't exist at all in any kind of uh, discussion. And it's like, is this, is this the, is this what a family cult looks like? Is this how a family um, cult works? And, um, and I, after I, I, I thought about this and brought back this memory and been going through my mind a few times, it reminded me of, of perhaps one of the more foundational traumas of my life, if I say it, my personality. Um, when I was nine years old, I was really, really miserable. Um, I was being bullied relentlessly at school, and I was really struggling. Uh, it was... I Before that year, I'd actually had friends in the neighborhood, but then they moved away, and I had no friends in at home and I had no friends at school I was completely isolated and um, I, I couldn't take it anymore and I remember I remember very clearly the morning um, my mother's driving me to the drop-off point for school and and I'm just crying and I, I'm punching the glove box in the car and I'm like no I can't I can't go. I, they, they, I, I hate school. I want to kill myself. I'm so miserable. I'd rather die than go to school. And I just remember my mother yelling at me, screaming at me, telling me, get out of the car, get out of the car. You're going to school um, because I can't be late for work. And um, I don't know. I stuck to my guns. I refused to get out of that car, and I just stayed like, no, I'm not going to school. I'm not going to be treated like this. I'm not going to be bullied. And uh, eventually, my mother relented, and and, but not in a in a good way. In a, in like, oh God, I have do I have to do this? Do I have to call my boss and say I'm not going to be in today? I'm going to be late today because my my son refuses to go to school, and it's that at sense, and I'll, I'll, I'll get more on that later, but. What ended up happening is um, the, the teachers kind of claimed they never noticed that I was being bullied. They never really saw it, and all, they were very sympathetic while my mother was in the room. But the, the damage had been done to me. I, I, I felt so hurt, so alone, so helpless, um, that I just gave up trying to fight back inside. I, I stuffed my feelings down, and I learned to just pretend like I was coping. Um, when I, <laughs> coping when inside, I just felt miserable. Always in pain, always in pain, and um, I, I, from time to time, I'd resist and I'd kind of fight back and you know try to get out of school, and I was just miserable and um. Well, my family didn't care. They, they were always angry with me. I was always in trouble because I didn't want to go to school and cause I was complaining about being bullied and sometimes physically beaten up. Um, and their way of looking at things wasn't that I was being abused, it, but that I was um, being unnecessarily demanding of their time. 
um, and attention because boys weren't worthy of care and attention. And it's like, I'm, God, why the hell even have kids if you don't have time for them? That was, that's one thing that comes to my mind, but it's just like, I, I just was, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a joy or, or a, a, um, a gift in their life. I was just an inconvenience the whole time and they would have been a lot happier without me. Um, the school actually, well, the school had a counsellor and they actually did something, I didn't know this at the time, it wasn't until years later when I read the reports, but the school were concerned that, that, I, that I wasn't happy. They were actually more concerned than my mother. And so they asked uh, my mother if I could get a psychological evaluation. Uh, and they sent me to a pediatrician and a psychologist to, to look at me. And um, and so at the school's request, I, I did go. I actually went to, uh, oh, met, I won't name the place, um, but it's a, a place where, well known where I live. Um, and um, I, I, they did all these tests and they had, they interviewed me and they, they, and I, I obviously told them a lot about what was bothering me. And, um, and they wrote a whole report on this. It's a, a like 30 page report on my, um, my, my mental and physical health. And, um, and they, they sent it to my mother and like, uh, because I've got it, got it, I can tell you, like they were saying things like, we're very concerned that, um, Jason's mother uh, doesn't seem to take this seriously. She does, she seems to be more concerned about how it impacts her than it impacts her son, who is clearly suffering a lot uh, from from loneliness and low self esteem. Low self esteem came up very often in this report. And um, in the report, it was saying that yeah, I was getting picked bullied a lot because of um, my speech because I had a speech impediment, and um, and they were like recommending that yeah, I should get. Um, uh, so uh, see a speech pathologist to help me with my speech, but also that the teachers of the school had assumed that I wasn't a very bright kid because I had very poor grades, but um, I had very high, I actually had a very high IQ, and that they were saying that it looks like Jason's very bored at school, not because he's not very bright, but the opposite that he's actually a lot more advanced than the other kids are uh, for his age. And that he's not being challenged enough and that the school needs to actually acknowledge this and take this into account um, with Jason. Now, the final thing in that report, in the final paragraph was saying, um, now, of course, due to the privacy issues, we can't just send this report directly to the school. It has to be sent to the mother. And so enclosed in this envelope are two copies of this report, one for parents and... Um, one for the school that they the school had requested and you know what I, i've got the i've got the envelope and um both copies are in there my, my mother never passed the report on to the school they, i she opened it she read it i assume she read it maybe she didn't bother reading it maybe it wasn't important enough for her to read uh, but she never passed it on to the school uh it was like it was just too much bother to actually you know take care of me her son which is another aspect of, of in a cult, because outsiders could easily see that something was wrong that the people inside couldn't see. Um, they were completely oblivious to. Um, the, the outsiders could see that there was something wrong, that my mother wasn't taking enough concern with my well-being. Um, but no one inside the family could see this problem, just as no one inside the, fa inside the cult can see the problems. Um, with the, the way that they're looking at the world. Um, but anyone else looking into the cult's like, duh, that's crazy. Um, and, and again, it's like, well, I, it's like I'm not important. Like, I, I mean, this was an issue for the whole of my schooling time. I was just bullied and harassed and I didn't fit in and I often had really bad teachers who didn't uh, appreciate me and Certainly no one took an interest in me, uh, in my academic abilities. And I, this, this might shock a lot of people, but I actually grew up with the view that I was actually dumb. I thought I was below average intelligence because I'd just been told I'd been stupid so much and no one had actually 
stood up for me. And, um, and it's like, wow, it's like, it mattered more. My, my mother was like, I'm, I'm there. Like I'm, I'm crying. I'm, I'm desperately needing help and attention at nine years old. And the thing that my mother's worrying about is that she doesn't want to be late to work because her boss might be unhappy with her being late for work. And again, it's like, it's like, I don't even exist as a male. Like I don't exist. This is, I mean, I, this is, these are two examples. I could bring up a dozen other ones. And it is a view that is shared by all the women in my family. And, um, that, you know, it's, there's a saying, and uh, and my mother actually taught this one to me, um, of all people. Um, Girls are made of sugar and spice and all things nice, but boys are made of slugs and snails and puppy dog tails. And my mother told it to me, and she thought it was very funny. And, you know, I, I laughed when she told me, but, you know, I do remember later on, kind of going, yeah, it's true, boys suck, we're really awful, I'm a disgusting, ugly boy. I go, damn, poor women have to put up with us boys. We're just just a blight on humanity. And um, for those of you who are familiar with with feminism, you'd you'd recognize this kind of, like, men aren't even people. We we exist purely to serve the entitled interests of of women. And, um, And that... Like, it's no surprising that feminist beliefs and ideology are rife throughout the, my family. Like, they, they kind of take on the feminist interpretation of history as a, a fact, even though there's no evidence for it at all. But um, the, the crunch point actually came, because, like, I, I was clearly... I was traumatized by this. I was traumatized by the fact my mother didn't care about me or my well-being, and, and I, I had a lot of issues with low self-esteem. And, um... I went through lots and lots of therapy, lots of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars spent on therapy and seeing lots of different therapists. And I had this, one of the breakthrough moments, like when I was just telling you about that nine-year-old experience and like when I was crying in the car and and I'm, I'm telling the therapist about what happened. Um, I was I was actually defending my mother at the time. I was taking her point of view about how hard things were for her, how much she was struggling with my father and with kids who were having problems and that she had to get to work and she didn't want to get into trouble. And so I, I'd adopted the, the worldview of the family cult that male feelings don't matter compared to female feelings, that, um, that my mother was a real victim, not me. And, and the therapist just asked me... Um, asked me this question and it's like if you'd been in your mother's shoes if it had been you there and with your son and your son was telling this how differently would you have reacted how would you have wanted to react um at seeing your parent react to you and it was just like wow that was one of the most mind-blowing ideas to contemplate because suddenly it's like the 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 scales fell from my eyes and I could see just how unhealthy, how toxic my family was. Because I'm like, if that was my son, oh my god, fuck. Oh, I wouldn't give a shit about work. I wouldn't give a shit about my boss and be about being late. My son is being attacked. My son is suffering. He wants to die. He's so miserable. I would move heaven and earth to protect my son from that. And I go... My mother didn't care. I didn't matter. Being late for work was what was important to her. That was what she was worried about. And, um, and it's like, um, it wasn't just me being affected. The sex ratio in my family is two to one in favor of women. And it, and it's not because more girl babies were born than um, boy babies. It's literally because the men um, either kill themselves or they neglect themselves so much they die very early, um, or they just disappear. They leave the family and they disconnect and cut all ties with it. Um, I I'm, I fit into one of those categories. I've cut ties with my family, um, and so there's this there's hardly any men in the family. 
because they're all gone. They're all fled or they're dead. Um, and yet, you don't, at family gatherings, especially when the women have been drinking a bit, you don't hear this like, oh, gee, you don't hear an insane like, why does, why do the men in this family, why does Spencer men keep, you know, dying and dying from self-neglect and why are they so depressed and miserable and why, why are there so many drug addicts and alcoholics amongst them? No, it's always, um... Oh, they're such trash. Yeah, we really, we really lucked out with, with the men in this family because they're just awful. They're not really, uh, they're not supporting us and they're embarrassing us because they're such bad men. And, it, and, it's, and it's like you can see the whole belief system in there that they, they're the victims. They're the victims and the men are the responsible for why they're so miserable. All their problems are caused by the men not sacrificing enough for the women. And, um... Like my, my father died um, from self neglect. He, he he had lung cancer. He had heart problems. He had kidney problems, um, and he, he never showed any like serious rational self concern for his health. He ate rubbish. He didn't exercise, and and he he was an alcoholic. Um, he wasn't suicidal, like not in, the, in the, uh, the active sense, but in a way he was very passively suicidal because he wouldn't do anything to look after himself, to take care of himself. And my uncles were much the same. Um, they wouldn't take care of themselves. And, and my brothers, my, both of them, but I'm thinking of my older one in particular, he, he just would not take care of himself. He just, he'd just self-destruct, just like his father, just like his uncles. And you know, my grandfather, I never met him. He died 12 years before I was born. Like no one's ever told me about like how he died and why he died so young. I mean, I'm kind of like, hey, you know, maybe there might be some kind of health problem that runs in the family that maybe I might, you know, want to know about because it might impact me, but nobody thought to tell me. Like these are things that like, when I think to myself, like I would... I'd want to tell other people, I'd want to warn other people in my family, I want to do it to try and protect them, to keep them safe, because I care about them. But I've never received that care. I've always been told that I have to have a really big heart to care about other people at the expense of myself. I internalized the belief that my feelings were worthless, and this impacted all aspects of my life. Like, I couldn't even, like, enjoy my hobbies, because I couldn't even see that my enjoyment of anything that I was doing was worthwhile. It really impacted my ability to work in a company. Um, I couldn't assert myself properly with my uh, with my boss or with my workmates. Um, uh, it was an, it was a lot of passive aggressiveness coming through there because I discount my feelings and discount them, hold them down, hold them down, then they explode. Um, it impacted my ability to have a healthy relationship. I just couldn't have it. Um, in one sense, I was attracted to a lot of um, narcissistic women who were abusive, or I would just discount myself so much in the relationship that um, I, I couldn't express myself, I couldn't show my feelings at all, or uh, um, and I, I, I'd just be in relationships I didn't want to be in, that I wasn't happy in. And I could never express it, and I could never talk about it, and that would ultimately all fail. And um, and so I, there was this lot of profound helplessness in my life that I couldn't actually get anywhere in these in these uh, work and um, and romantic spheres. There was just heartbreak and disappointment after the other, after the other, and I just couldn't break free from this cycle. Um. And, you know, it's, in the end, it's like, I, um, you know, there's this thing about cults, like, they, you, they, they put this idea in your head, you can't leave them, you can't ever leave the cult, you must, you must stay in the cult, you can only, the, the outside world's bad, and it's only good inside the cult, like, however miserable you might feel, the cult's a place for you to be. And, um, and it's really funny, because, like, I... One Christmas, I, I, I mean, I've just always been miserable hanging out with my family because um, they, don't, they, they don't really care about my opinions or show me any politeness or respect. I usually get just a lot of sarcastic and mean 
comments and um, I'll get dismissed and I'm, I'm, I'm laughed at and mocked. It doesn't matter what I do, what I achieve, I'll be laughed at and mocked by them. And, um, and like one Christmas, I was just feeling so miserable around my family. I started having suicidal thoughts and I'm like, oh my God, I have not had suicidal thoughts in a long time. Um, and, and just, I being around my family right now, I just like, I feel like I'd rather be dead. And I thought I can't let myself stay in this situation. I can't keep putting myself in harm. I have to protect myself. I have to take steps to make myself happier, to, to look after, to make sure I'm safe. And so I, I decided, well, I'm just not going to go to, to family gatherings anymore. I'm just going to pull away from them. I'm not going to spend much time with them because the more time I spend with them, the more unhappy I am. And and so I started pulling away. And, um, you know, uh, the reaction I always got was always like I was attacking them. It was never like, oh, Jason, are you okay? Why do you need to... Um, to, to why aren't you happy? Or why are you not happy or something like that? It was always like a personal thing, like, oh, what have you got against us? What? Why? Why are you doing this to us? Like I was the one attacking them, and it's like, um, you know, with my mother, like, I was being bullied at school. That was that was what was happening. But as far as my mother was concerned, she was being bullied by a nine-year-old son complaining about being bullied. Like I was some kind of weak, stupid, needy. Um, harassing nine-year-old that she had to put up with that was so hard on her being the victim um, and and that again it's like I, I I can't contact with my family because they they treat me like trash and they don't appreciate me and they're certainly not happy to have me around um, and and yet at the same time it's like they're, they're really upset that I wouldn't want to spend time with them like it's a cult I'm not allowed to leave I have to stay with them forever no matter how badly they treat me um, of course I don't I don't need to I don't need to and you know I, I've had some Christmases completely by myself and I know I felt very miserable very sad and alone but I never felt suicidal by myself I never felt that bad it was definitely improvement compared to what it was with my family. It was a big improvement. And, um, it's, yeah, um, I, I hadn't actually ever thought of it like being like a cult until I read that comment. And I'm like, I, I'd always kind of figured it was, it was like feminism. It was these bad ideas. People believe these bad things. But now I'm like, it is kind of like a, um, a, a, a like that pseudo religious cult, where, where they've got these beliefs and, and feminism promotes these beliefs, which I I don't think feminism necessarily causes these dysfunctional families, but it kind of uh, strengthens them, it encourages them, um, and um, and so it reinforces them, keeps them from actually breaking away and actually doing some healing and, and getting therapy because I keep getting that positive reinforcement. And, and I do think my family kind of resent me not like leaving the family, not talking to them because it's throwing a spanner into the work of, of them being like, they, they kind of need me to be a scapegoat for their unhappiness, for their misery in their life. And if I'm not there, then they can't use me as a scapegoat or not very well. Um, and yeah, so yeah, in the end, I um, I left the cult of my family, and that's sad because you know I I really like I don't know like I love family, I value family. Values a really family is a really high value thing to me. Like um, if I have a family in the future, it's going to be everything for me. That's that's that's. It's going to be the most important thing, and it's um, and and it's kind of an interesting uh, topic. Maybe I should talk about um, why, when you have very narcissistic, selfish parents, you can kind of go the opposite way. Like most kids, kind of turn out just like their narcissistic parents, but some they kind of go the opposite way and become hyper empathetic, and that's probably worth a video in itself. Um, but in the end, like, how can I be part of a family of people who hate me? And then that's what they, they do. And I, you know, I've been told by so many people that, um, 
oh no, they don't really hate you. They, you just don't understand the way they love you. And I, I, when I have heard that, it's like it's always been denying my own personal experience and invalidating me and validating what I've been through. And that was actually part of inspiration for me. Like, hey, I should be a therapist. Like, apart from the fact I've, I've acquired all this self-knowledge and all this time and, and, and learning about psychology and therapy over the, these years, but also that... Um, I do see these mistakes, particularly when it comes to invalidating people's experiences. And they, the people, I mean, they do it well intentionally, but it, it really does hurt when you've been abused all your life by someone and then someone takes the side of the abuser. Not cool. <laughs> Not cool. And uh, I don't think, uh, if you haven't really been abused, you can't really appreciate how uncool that is, just how hurtful that is. And so I was like, well, yeah, you know, I actually can offer that insight because I can offer that that empathy that connection with people who have been abused um but also for me it's it's also like well you know I always wanted to I, I, I had these dreams for a lot of time that oh yeah my family would actually get therapy and we would talk about it we'd share experiences and we'd deprogram ourselves and we'd actually all be happy and like well that that's not a realistic thing that's not going to happen um but at least I can help other people to try and get that, to reach that place if they can, or I think a lot of people can. And that to me is like, well, that's the, that's the next best thing I can do. Anyway, so that was a bit different from my, my usual program. Um, I, I hope you did find it very insightful, um, if, particularly if you're going through something similar. Like, I'd be really interested if you actually feel like your family's a cult, because if that's the case, I'd... I'd love to hear your perspectives. Um, or anyone who thinks this is nuts, you can't compare this to cult. That's always interesting to hear. But um, or sometimes it's very interesting to hear because you hear these new insights I hadn't thought about before. But um, yeah, that's it for this week. Um, stay safe. And until next time, Prospera Ad Astra. <laughs>